Everybody deserves a second chance. Hell, as long as you haven't done anything awful, you should be given as many chances as you want. We should never begrudge anyone of any opportunity, even if we don't understand. It's just far better to live a life where you encourage others rather than try and drag them down, and you will feel better too. Long live positivity. With that said, there certainly have been a few wrestlers throughout the years that have confused the audience with how many times they were given another crack at the whip. For one reason or another, management believed in them, and yet for one reason or another, they could never really get it going. It's the magic of the profession, I suppose. For every Daniel Bryan, who those in charge never thought could be a main event guy, there's a Viscera who was allowed to try over and over and over and over again, even though he got the same results. This has happened a lot, though, which is why I'm Simon from What Culture, and this is 10 wrestlers who were given way too many chances. Number 10, Test. Andrew Martin looked great, and you know what? He wasn't as bad in the ring as people like to make out. With the right gimmick and protection, he easily could have gone all the way to the top, Unfortunately, he didn't. This isn't to say he wasn't used either. Test was given a pretty damn good role with the corporation and even had that soap opera storyline with Stephanie McMahon that ended when Triple H entered proceedings and stole his girl. That was really where he hit the wall too. Instead of having a massive feud with the game, he kind of just got his ass kicked and after you've been cheated out of your relationship to boot, well, it's not a good fit. The audience all of a sudden saw Test as a bit of a loser. From here, he just flipped and flopped from one team to the next, but it never really worked. He wasn't an American, a member of the Alliance, part of TNA. It was just so underwhelming. And then in 2004, he was let go. As you know from the title of this video, though, there was another go around. And it came in 2006 when he returned in ECW and got a push that seemed like he would finally get to where he needed to be. Unless that didn't happen, he fell out with the powers that be, and he got let go again. The real shame here was that for a guy who seemed to have it all, he never made it to the promised land. And it makes it even worse when you learn that he tragically passed away a few years after this. Number 9 and 8, Primo and Epico. Primo and Epico are alright, genuinely. Go and check out their stuff down in Puerto Rico, and you'll soon see that basing their skill level on their WWE run is not fair. Admittedly, you'd have to go back in time to do that now as they've been off our screens for so long and yet amazingly, they are still employed, you would be forgiven for thinking otherwise. Where it all falls down under the watchful eye of Vince McMahon is that he seems adamant they have to be a team no matter what. Because they are the cousin and brother of Carlito, meaning there's a thread running through it, WWE pushed them together in 2011 and they've kept them that way ever since. And sure, they won tag team gold, but who remembers that now? I mean, they had Rosa Mendes as their manager for a while too, but again, it's barely a memory. It also doesn't help they were repackaged constantly. They were lost Matadores, which was straight out of 1985, and once they'd been forced to lose every single match they had, another spruce up saw them return as the shining stars, that was just lazy. The whole bit was, hey, we love Puerto Rico and you should go there. What are you talking about? How does that tie into wrestling? If WWE just let these two go at their own pace, it would probably solve everything, but at this stage, there's not much chance of that. Need to get back on television first. When that will happen, I do not know. Number 7, Viscera. I get why Vince McMahon loves big dudes. They do turn your head at an airport, but just because you look like a beast doesn't mean you're going to be a top-tier pro wrestler. It's not the be-all and end-all, even if people gape at you in awe. Way back in the 90s, though, when things had to change in the then-WWF because of the steroid trial, the focus simply went from huge rip guys to massive men. It's why you saw the likes of Bastian Booger, Yoko Zuna, and Mabel all of a sudden in top roles. And while Yoko got over huge, it wasn't going to work for everyone. Take the mentioned Mabel. He was pretty good with Mo in Men on a Mission, but after a poor King of the Ring win, he was let go. A few years later, he returned, although now he was Viscera. A henchman that actually fitted into the Ministry of Darkness quite nicely, there was still this idea that he should be in prominent positions, even though he wasn't clicking. Big Vis was simply a big man who lost a lot, that doesn't do much for your security guard type image and gimmick. WWE then cut him once more, and then for some reason, hired him back four years later. Even then, the switches kept coming, however, as he was the world's largest love machine, and then Big Daddy V. Those names alone will have you raising an eyebrow. The truth is, because he was 6'6 and 300 pounds, McMahon thought he could get him over. And he did to a certain degree, but it felt like we'd done all we could long before WWE realized that was the case. Number 6, Sin Cara. No longer with the company, mostly because of everything we're about to discuss, Sin Cara's run in WWE was doomed as soon as the person behind the mask was switched. 
is never a good sign. This tied into what was going on behind the scenes too, because it was never about who took up the mantle and more about the character itself. You could have put anyone in that suit, but even after a few months, fans had decided they didn't really care. Joining in 2011 as Triple H's first big project, all the little ideas that were brought in for the man constantly fell short. He wrestled under blue lights for a while, had a trampoline during his entrance, was portrayed as a superhero. WWE should have just cut their losses when Mystico left the company, but they didn't. Hunako stepped into those shoes instead, and there was even a fake Sin Cara for a while. It's all so strange. Clearly, everyone involved thought they had something here, but it never really hit the highs that were expected. If it was anyone else, the cord would have been pulled far earlier, and that may have helped the men involved too. Number five, Brian Adams. Brian Adams looked like he could kick your ass. That's good. Guess what, though? No one had any idea what to do with him, something that's becoming a theme throughout this list. Take his first role in WWF where he stepped into Demolition. Straight away, that was a tough gig because he was entering into a team that everybody already loved and didn't think needed expanding. He was called Crush, a name he kept after the group broke up, but for no reason he went from some tough bloke to a surfing Hawaiian. I mean, what the hell happened? The waves didn't relax him as he turned heel and bait up his best friend Randy Savage, which ended up with the first ever Falls Count Anywhere match in WWE at WrestleMania 10. Stipulation wasn't as finesse back then, and it completely took away from their feud. He eventually left this behind to join the Nation of Domination and then the Disciples of the Apocalypse before going to WCW and once again just jumping from gimmick to gimmick. He was part of the NWO, the original Kiss Demon, a member of Chronic, and at no point during his 11 year run did anyone just allow him to find a character and stick with it and that's why this all fell apart number four hornswoggle another wrestler who fell foul to being put in bad positions it's not hard to work out that vince mcmahon found hornswoggle hilarious so used him as a get out of jail free card as much as he could it started when he was teamed with fit finley because you know he was irish and swoggle could be a leprechaun and before he was released he had been the anonymous raw gm and mcmahon's illegitimate son neither of those were satisfying endings to stories that played out over a long ass time you can't really blame dylan postel the man behind the gimmick as he was just doing what he was asked and really he did it as well as anybody could but when you are put in these positions the fans are always gonna groan it's also why when he was allowed to spread his wings and have that we lc match with torito the crowd picked up that was different and cool as opposed to testing their intelligence if wwe had played to his strengths more there's no reason why he couldn't have offered something fresh to proceedings but that was never the plan or the idea number three tensai Matt Bloom is a great trainer down in NXT, was an absolute beast in Japan, and yet never really found his place in WWE. It's a wonder as not only was he massive, but also knew what he was doing inside the ring, but it's almost as if the creative team was against him. Brought in as Prince Albert, which yes, is a slang term for having your penis pierced, you could see WWE was confused as he quickly became a tag team guy. He was put with Droz, the big boss man test, and when none of those worked out, he was part of X Factor, which didn't fit at all. The same of which can be said for when he became the hip hop hippo. I mean, what? It seems as if we nixed this when he became A Train, but clearly fearing the world would end if he wasn't in a tag team, he was then soon paired with the big show. At that point, Vince had seen enough. That did allow Bloom to shine in Japan, but when he returned eight years later, it was like history repeating itself. As opposed to just being an ass kicker, he was now Tensai, a dude who wrote on his own face. He was meant to be in the main event, which he could have done if he had been brought in as Giant Bernard, but we can't do that. Weird gimmicks have to get in the way. This was done when fans started to chant, shave your back in reference to his Albert days. And that was the end of that. Number two, Curtis Axel. Another guy who has just vanished, Curtis Axel's biggest mountain was that his dad was Mr. Perfect. It's always unfair to compare a son to his father, but WWE went so far out of the way to hide this, it actually hurt Axel more. The entire world knew what the deal was, and yet no one was allowed to acknowledge it on television. It was madness. Coming in as Michael McGillicutty wasn't the best idea either, as it's a terrible name, and while being part of the Nexus was a huge plus for a while, we all know how that ended. It saw Curtis go back to NXT as Creative had a rethink, which did see him emerge as a new Paul Heyman guy. This was pure fire from an on-paper point of view, but again, the company never went all in with it. Take his feud with Triple H. It seemed like it was designed to get Axel over, but instead he just became cannon fodder for the game. It did nothing for him. He then became somewhat of a comedy wrestler, and while the B-team have always been entertaining, they can't even get on Raw or SmackDown, so who the hell is that going to help? Feels like the ship has sailed on Curtis, and that is a crying shame should have just been the second coming of Mr. Perfect, much like Charlotte Flair has done with her own legacy. 
Oh well. Number one, Ed Leslie. Ed Leslie's first successful gimmick was as a hairdresser. This is all you need to know. Dubbed Brutus the Barber Beefcake, the most 80s name you can find, there was some joy to be taken from this as he would cut his opponent's hair and he handed up to the max. Tied at the hip to best bud Hulk Hogan though meant he followed in the Hulkster's footsteps, including hightailing it over to WCW when the immortal one left. He couldn't worry about hair there of course, so much like others in this list it was just one crazy gimmick to the next. He was Brutai, the Butcher, the Man with No Name, the Booty Man, the Zodiac. These were pretty much exactly the same with a new outfit, and by the time he was the Disciple, yet another incarnation that had the in front of the title, his whole role was to stand behind Hogan and look like he was mad. Leslie left World Championship Wrestling when Hulk left too, surprise, surprise, and my sole memory of him is when I asked him for an interview at the first Starcast, and he looked at me like I was crazy. I mean, he's not wrong but still. Know of any other wrestlers who were given way too many chances? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Then head over to whatculture.com and read yourself some articles. Follow What Culture on Twitter at WhatCultureWWE. My name is Simon from WhatCulture and I will talk to you again soon.